Good evening, ladies and gents. Welcome to the live. I'm going to talk a little bit about my experience of being inside of narcissistically abusive relationships. Yes, plural, because once was not enough. Um, and then we'll do a live Q&A. Uh, this will be available for playback and uh, rewatching after about 30 minutes, I think it takes. If you're joining us after live, welcome. I hope this is of some use. I was very resistant to the idea that I was in a quote unquote narcissistically abusive relationship. I've been in three. I've been in three um, of 15, 14 relationships I've been in. Now, I had had i had it had sorry to non-english speakers i had had relationships with women before that were non-functional that you could say were toxic you could say there was mental health issues present there was even drug addiction um, and eating disorders present in in a couple of my relationships and i had good relationships as well when i was younger but once I stopped speaking to my father uh, at the age of 28. I then went into three narcissistically abusive relationships, almost back to back. Uh, there was two. Then I was in a relationship with a, with 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 a. Sorry, in the north in the north of England we say girl, a girl, a girl, when you mean a woman, um, and sometimes. People who don't speak English as their first language, they get offended by that. Don't call women girls. It's patronising. It's where I'm from. That's what we say. Women are girls and men are lads. So I'll try not to do that. Um, so I was in a relationship with a, a woman who uh, had a terrible upbringing and struggled a lot with uh, depression, but was not abusive she was she was just indifferent she would just she would just become very cold and very indifferent as a defense mechanism uh, without warning so i was initially very very reluctant to say that i'd been in a narcissistically abusive relationship the first one that would qualify was in 2009 and after about a year of being with her um i started to do what probably everybody here has done, what we've all done, which I was starting to Google um, some explanation for her strange behavior. Uh, things like, why does my girlfriend seem to lack any sort of empathy? Why does my girlfriend not have, a, have any sense of personal responsibility or accountability for her actions? Why does she want everything all of her own way? And I actually ended up in 2009, 2010, uh, again and again in the narcissistic abuse forums that were there and I found it so overwhelming I was like I just I can't I can't look at this stuff it wasn't until my second go around uh, after the relationship and the break the breakup with her was so awful and so damaging that I think I was completely and totally celibate for three three years I was a celibate halibut for three years of my life. So if you've read my book, A Cult of One, when I talk about going to Malaysia, the entire time that I was there, um, I was I was uh, celibate. I just stayed away from it because the, the experience was so, was so awful. I did it again in 2014. What was the experience like? In both cases, Sorry, in all three cases, what I noticed first was that there seemed to be two parallel relationships running side by side. That's how I felt. And I was being told, we are in relationship X. And the paradigms of the relationship are kindness and commitment and fairness and love 
and loyalty and so on and so forth. And I would be told that's 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 where you live. That's where we live, babe. We live here. But then my daily lived experience that was that we were in relationship. Why? And in relationship, why? It was not based on kindness and fairness and love and commitment and loyalty. It was based on the person I was with getting as much as they possibly could and taking as much as they possibly could from me and from other people with wanton abandon whilst taking no responsibility for the consequences of their actions. And it was very much my, in all three relationships, you, you might resonate with this, you might, was, was um, there was a very strong feeling of uh, bullying. It was punitive, meaning it was, it was a lot of crime and punishment involved in the relationship. And I'd be like, so I'd sit down, as you have done, and be like, okay, obviously I'm not a perfect human being, I'm not a perfect boyfriend, but you told me, <laughs> you said at 7.42 p.m. on August the 12th, and I know because I've started writing this stuff down because you're driving me effing crazy, that the paradigms of our relationship would be this, this, and this. This is what you asked of me. This is what we agreed to. And you promised to behave in this way. And yet, darling, precious love of my life, I find that the actions don't match the words. And this would be met uh, in one of two ways. It would be met either with um, rage, contempt, humiliation, um, and, and threats, or there would be a histrionic display of exaggerated victimhood. Oh, uh, you just don't really love me. You still love your ex. You've never loved me. Nobody's ever loved me. You're just like everybody else. You hate me. Go on then, break up with me. I knew you were going to do this. Prove to me how awful I am and just break up with me. So then I, di I didn't want to break up with uh, any of them because these are three relationships where I had made the conscious decision to live with them or better put, allow them to live with me because in all three cases, I was the one with a place to live. And in all three cases, they were the one with not a place to live, which <laughs> If you've looked at the, if you've looked at the literature on not just narcissism but psychopathy, um, can be one of the indicators. Can be one of the indicators. So, and 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 I chose to live with them because uh, I loved them, and in all three cases, my intention was to uh, get married and have children. So when you come on my Instagram and we do a Q and A and you think it's cute to get all chopsy about the fact that I'm 46 and single, um, it's not a great source of humor for me, to be perfectly honest. It's actually quite painful to hear people making jokes about me being a man child or afraid of commitment or uh, just being obsessed with being a lone wolf. No, at the age of 29, I wanted to get married and I wanted to have children. And that just didn't happen for me. And I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't do anything about that. And uh, that was a relationship that, it, it, as I said to you at the, in the beginning of this, it completely devastated me. Um, to the point where I was celibate for three years and single for four. So, or, or maybe five. I think it's four. I think it's four. Um, I wanted uh, to be in 
a normal, loving relationship. I wanted to look like the couple in the IKEA catalog. I wanted to be a father before the age of 40. That was what I was hoping for. Um, and yeah, because, well, for various reasons that we'll get into that, that just, that didn't happen. But in all, all three of these relationships, I felt like there was a double track. There was a relationship X and relationship Y. And, um, it also felt, it felt very bullying. I felt like I was being bullied and threatened, um, heavily manipulative. There was no, there was literally, I don't know what your experience was, but for, for me looking back, there was no honest adult to adult communication. All of these were basically a long con. They were all long cons. So there was never one moment of sincere adult to adult communication. It was just a manipulation to uh, get me where they wanted me. And by character and by nature, I'm quite generous, especially if I'm in love. And by character and by nature, I'm loyal and I'm caring. And they saw that and they knew that. And instead of saying, oh, that's good. I've uh, found someone that I can create a safe and stable environment with. They said, oh, that's good. I've found somebody that I can absolutely rip the arse out of for a couple of years and take money from and take love from and take care from. And I'll just lie to him for as, for as long as I can and then lie to other people about what the paradigms of the relationship are. That's another facet of the narcissistically abusive relationships I've been in that you will probably recognize. All three of these women went out of their way to lie to, as far as I know, everyone possible about the paradigms of the relationship. I even had, I don't, I, I won't tell you the explicit details, because publicly it's humiliating. I had a situation in a, a family that is not of the same ethnicity as me. And I learned that language, the language of this different family and this different family's ethnicity. And this girl had, sorry, woman. I said at the beginning, I would stop saying girl. It's a Northern expression, get over it. This woman had cheated on me and she, I learned the family knew that we'd had a problem. And so instead of telling her family what she'd done, she just reversed it and she told them that I cheated on her. So then I was in a situation where people, I didn't really speak their language well, but I'd done my best to learn it over two years and they didn't speak English. But I had uh, the aunties of this family berating me and wagging their fingers at me for cheating on their precious niece when it was actually her who cheated on me. So another element there is um, is uh, oh yeah, uh, they will tell everybody you know and everybody they know another story so you're always living inside of a parallel reality there's the reality that they feed you in the relationship because you're a mushroom so they keep you in the dark and feed you shit you're a useful idiot it's like being it's like being taken on by somebody for like aspiring or something you're 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 an asset you're you're what an intelligence agency would call an asset so the asset is fed whatever narrative keeps the asset uh functioning and doing its job and then there's the real world, which is outside of that. Excuse me. Uh, and in the real world, I was just a mark. I was just, I was just being conned. I was just completely being conned. Um, but inside of our false reality, uh, the simulation, the matrix, uh, 
there was a different reality. So there was bullying, there was histrionic displays of vulnerability. So if I ever said, hey, this isn't fair, there'd either be rage, silence, humiliation, um, in two out, mm, I can't prove anything. I can't prove anything, but I think uh, there was at the very least emotional cheating, maybe non-physical cheating, but I know that if they got angry with me, they would provoke my uh, dread that the relationship was going to end or that they were going to have sex with somebody else by, uh, at the very least, giving their number to other guys or chatting to other guys. Whether that was consummated, oh, so, and only one of the three relationships I know it was consummated. And, and she actually didn't do that as punishment. She did that because she could. She just she just did it because she could. Um, and it was, she went away on a, a, a girls weekend a hen party um, and then came back to to my house, to where she was living at my house, rent free. Um, but I'm not better. Like the Murphys, I'm not better. And uh, she, she was such a dope. She was still tired and hung over. She messaged the guy on uh, Facebook, this is 2010, so we had these big, big old computers, and then just went to sleep and left Facebook open, left her Facebook on and open, messaging the guy that she'd, uh, she cheated on me with. That was the first relationship. And the other two, I don't, I can't prove that that, that there was, there was punishment sex, but I for sure know, uh, that there was the, there was the flirtation with men sometimes it was even done in front of me as a form of control and punishment to evoke as much dread as possible so you would switch between the fight response which would be very bullying very very pred predatory and then this um histrionic response where they would try to evoke feelings of guilt and shame by becoming the biggest victim in the room um in all three of these relations, you would probably be sat there, even victims of narcissistic abuse would be there. That's terrible, why don't you just split up with them? So in all three cases, uh, I did try to split up with them. And in all three cases, at the moment where I said, okay, I don't know what's going on here, but like, I ain't doing this anymore. Um, all three screamed and cried and begged uh one of them two of them literally knelt on the floor in front of me uh sobbing and saying please please i promise i promise i'll change i promise i know i have a problem i promise i promise i'll change i told this story somewhere else and, and i only thought about it again recently um one of the goals uh <laughs> we, we'd separated we did split up and we'd moved to different countries. And whilst we were in different countries, she was talking to me via some social media app, I don't know which one, and she admitted uh, that she was very sick, that she, uh, that she knew she was doing this to me and that she would go to therapy for it. And I went, oh, great, great, we have a chance. We, we'd been apart for three months, but I still really loved her and I missed her and I, I wanted her back. And then I went to the country where she was and she denied ever saying it. She denied, she said, I've never said that I have a problem and I've never said that I'll go to therapy. You need to go to therapy. It's you that has to go to therapy. That was the experience of being in it and of trying to break out of it. When they screamed, when they were crying and begging, because um, as somebody who's raised uh, in an environment that led me to be a codependent, I couldn't... I didn't have the strength um, to say something like what I would say now after a few years of therapy, which is I didn't see all these tears when you were bullying me. <laughs> Who's this? Why, why, what are you crying for now? And then I would just leave and just let them let them get on with it because it's, it's not my problem. Um, but at that time, I couldn't do that. I wasn't strong enough to do it. I went to therapy for all 
through relationships um, and therapy helped, but I didn't stick with it for long enough. In the second relationship, I got out because she sent me to therapy. She said, you were very, very sick. She was always, she was always, uh, oh, that's what I wanted to say um, because it might resonate with you. I was always made to feel like I was doing something wrong. I was always made to feel like I wasn't good enough. I was always made to feel like I wasn't kind enough or giving enough or uh, quite frankly, I was just made to feel like I was deficient in some way. Why? No reason, uh, it, because it works. It's, it's not that deep. You know, if it works for me to insinuate or make you feel like you are deficient, then you feel deficient, then the blame is on you and not on the abuser. It's a it's fairly simplistic, robotic tactics. Uh, they know that people who are raised to feel a lot of guilt and shame um, feel it quickly anyway. They figure that out about you. They scan you and they can figure out that you're hyper-conscientious and you're liable to feel guilt and shame. So then they just push, they just push that button in you. And... Um, it, it it's like i don't know like superman with kryptonite or something it just all of your strength just leaves you leaving the relationships the first one uh i should have gone to therapy and stayed in therapy i wish i had because i might have saved of 15 years of my life um i didn't want to end it but I just made myself do it and it felt like some horror movie scenario where I had to saw off my own arm and I knew it was going to hurt and it was going to hurt for a while it hurt more and for longer than I could have imagined it was awful and I really needed I, I was I wasn't mentally well and I really needed support but I didn't know it so I didn't ask for it the second time around it was tough, but she she'd basically uh, screaming at me. If you've read a cult of one, this is this is the girl who used to scream at me when I was asleep. Uh, I'd wake up to her standing over me, screaming at me because she was so effing psychotic. We would argue. The argument would end at like midnight. I'd be like, I'm going to bed and I'm going to go to sleep. So I go to bed and go to sleep. And then she'd stay in the living room and continue arguing with me when I wasn't there continue arguing with her own interjected version of me and then hit a peak in the argument and then come and re-involve the real me back in her argument, but with no, at like peak adrenaline. So I'd be woken up at half two in the morning with, she wasn't a large, she wasn't large, she wasn't physically, she wasn't physically threatening, except I started to worry she could stab me up in the night. Um, and I did, I did get worried a couple of times that she was going to glass me. Uh, but, yeah, well, obviously that's very emotionally dysregulating if you're asleep, in deep sleep, and somebody's screaming at you. The funniest thing with, with uh, it was hilarious. Let me tell you the funny thing about that. Um, she would scream at me. I would say, look, we do, we, this is the girl I'd split up with. She admitted she had a problem. She said she'd go to therapy. We got back together and she was like, I never said I had a problem. She deleted whatever messages there were on the social media app. And she was like, I never said I'd go to therapy. You need to go to therapy. And uh, I would say to her, may God strike me dead if this isn't true. <laughs> she, of the three, of the three, only she did this because I don't, obviously narcissistic personality disorder is not usually diagnosed on its own. It's highly comorbid with other personality disorders and other mental health issues. And I think that she was, um, I don't know much about psychotic spectrum disorder, but I'm pretty sure that she was psychotic. This, this was a girl who could fly into a rage because I said boa tard to a Portuguese air stewardess when we entered the cabin. Portuguese air stewardess said to me, Boa tarde, senhor. And I said, Boa tarde. And I sat down and she flew into a fucking rage, not on the plane, but after the plane. Um, at another point, she got she got into a rage about something. 
and I swear this is true, I lived in Dublin at the time, she screamed at me and I set a timer on my watch because she used to scream at me for like a couple of hours. She screamed at me for six hours nonstop. And if you know Malahide in Dublin, I drove from the castle to the estuary to the tennis courts car park to the gym. I would just take her to different car parks <laughs> and sit there <laughs> while she fucking screamed at me. Um, with just incredible, she's only small. She's like, she's a small human, small woman. Um, but she had incredible energy when it came to rage. And I'd be like, she'll burn out in a minute. She'll burn out in a minute. And one day, if you know, if you know that part of Dublin, uh, I think at one point we, we, I drove her up to Port Marnock. She was screaming at me all the way to Port Marnock. I parked. I sat there for an hour and a half and I was like, because people can hear it. They could hear that there was a problem. I was like, they're going to call, they're going to call the guards. The, 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 in, in, in Ireland, the, the police are called the guard. They're going to call the guards. So I was, and I can't take it to the apartment because they'll definitely call the guards. So I just drove around different places in Dublin while she screamed at me. <laughs> psychotically accusing me of the wildest the wildest things even th I, I mean in the beginning we were in uh, I had been with her for two years so I knew what she was like the period in Dublin was the very end of it and I was like this is going nowhere so I didn't even I didn't even argue with it by then but she would get um and I, I I'm only laughing because it's 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 dark humor she was a very, very damaged human being. And she would start to conflate me with other boyfriends. And it's not like there was a honeymoon period and I can say, oh, she was wonderful for six months and then the monster came out. She did that in the first two weeks. She had two glasses of wine, admittedly on an empty stomach, um, and then started ranting at me with an argument that had no context to me whatsoever. And it was about a Spanish dude. <laughs> That's, I'm not even Spanish. What the, What are you doing? Like, what's what's happening here? Um, and so she would accuse me of really wild things, really, really strange, really, really strange things, um, which is funny as a survivor. Uh, but then from another perspective, from like a mental health I wouldn't say I'm a mental health advocate, but I guess like I talk about mental health. It's actually really worrying. It's actually really, really sad. It's really, really sad. Um, and it became, it became embarrassing uh, for her because uh, to cut a long story short, she asked me to do a favor for her and, and pull out a, um, a suitcase and start to pack it because she was, she was doing something and we were, we were going to go somewhere. And inside the suitcase, I found a notebook that was filled with the most demented, repetitive, ranting scrawl all about me and how much she hated me. Uh, and that wasn't funny. That was uh, chilling. It was like the scene in, um, in The Shining where, where you think Jack Nicholson's working. Jack Nicholson is like, I need silence. I need solitude to work. And his wife is like, oh, he seems a bit tense. You know, he seems a bit tense, but maybe if he does his work, maybe, you know, his wife is very, very nervous. I don't know if you know the backstory to that, but Stanley Kubrick psychologically tortured that poor actress to make her look even more nervous. Um, and then you think he's working. You think he's like, great. He's, he's a writer and he's kind of cranky. But he's working and then the camera pans and he's just written the same sentence over and over and over again for sheets and sheets of paper it's really chilling and so i lived that but it was about me and how much she despised me but remember what i said in the beginning about relationship x versus a relationship y the relationship you're told you're living in versus the one you're really living in she begged me to get back with her because she loved me so much. But the time at the time period when she was begging me to get back with her, she was on the phone to me trying to get me back and then going away and writing how much she hated me. She was uh, uh, not hated. 
despised me with an unbearable obsession. Like only someone who was being tortured by how much they loathed another human being. Why? Because I had broken up with her, because I had created that narcissistic injury. And pulling me back in, I realize in hindsight, was only an opportunity to take more revenge and to fulfill her narcissistic rage. Um, but I've told this story before. She, she insisted I went to therapy and I went in Malahide. Oh, I always forget his name. God damn it. He's a really, he's a really nice uh, counselor. Is he Robert? He's Robert. Robert. Um, email me afterwards. If you live in Dublin, I can, I can give you the guy's details. Um, and then she wanted to go to relationship counseling, but I'd already done six weeks with this other counselor. And I knew, I knew we were doomed. I knew it was just, it was just doomed. And we went to a relationship counselor, a South African guy who was really good. Um, and he called me outside of his professional boundaries and said, he didn't tell me to break up with her, but he said, you know what you have to do. And he was very kind. And uh, so I did, and that was difficult. It wasn't as bad as the first time around, but it was hard. And uh, then I waited another three years to get back into another go again. During therapy recently, I uh, realized that a lot of this just goes back to childhood trauma. And if you're raised by psychotic, drunk, selfish humans who are very traumatized and very damaged themselves, it will leave you with damage. It will leave you with scars. And these have to be tended to. Um, so I mentioned at the beginning that the narcissistic abusive relationships only happened or only started to occur once I'd made the decision to set a boundary with, with my father and to stop speaking to him. And so during the therapy, this time around of the therapy that I'm actually sticking with, um, the superego injunctions didn't stop. So the colonized part of you that's colonized through the abuse doesn't die just because you go no contact with the abuser it lives on and it has to be dealt with it has to be dealt with very carefully but directly uh, with professional help with the help of a, of a of a qualified clinician that you can have good rapport with and just because somebody's qualified on paper I'm not saying credentialed there's a difference between credentials and competency you need somebody who's competent not just credential any person with somewhat above IQ, um, above average IQ and a work ethic can get qualified, can get credentialed, but that doesn't mean they're competent. So you need someone who's competent. Um, and uh, the superego injunctions from childhood, they were pushing me to relive the betrayal and the chaos and the unsafety and the pain of childhood. My introjected parents, my introjected abusers, the people who I had internalized were encouraging me to find other people. And it's, it's strange, you know, because obviously if you suffered at the hands of somebody who's a pedophile and say it's a pedophile woman, or a paedophile man when you're five or 10 or 13, you would think, how, how are you as a 35 year old, 40 year old, 45 year old heterosexual male gonna find that? But you can, you can, you can find a blend of the core coordinates of the people who damaged you in somebody who's a uh, different sex 
or different sexuality. It, it really doesn't matter. You know, this kind of therapeutic work makes you realize um, a lot of that stuff is actually, it, it's not irrelevant, but it's, it's pretty superficial. I just wanted to add, because I think this is such a terrible mistake and it, it, it makes me so sad. I, I suffered at the hands of men and in one case, quite a young man, he was only 18. I never, I never hated men for that. I never generalized it and said, I hate men for this. I never generalized it and said, I hate gays now. I hate gay men for this. I suffered at the hands of two, two women when I was younger. And then uh, women in relationships when I was older, I never, never came to the conclusion, I hate women. I, ne I, never, I never did that. And I hope nobody who, who follows me would permit themselves such, such ill-disciplined reasoning. I expect, I expect, <laughs> I expect more from you. You, you, you can't. I know, I know it's easy and I know it's fun. I know it's fun. And I know I, I, I understand like the desire to, to generalize and to just say this group of people are shit. I get it. And I really do. And then, so you get hurt. You get hurt by someone of a ethnicity, of a, a, a background or a nationality, or, you know, <laughs> what? there was a guy who stalked me and sexually abused me for 18 months and he was Canadian. I don't hate Canadians. <laughs> And I don't, I don't, I don't think that's a reasonable conclusion. <laughs> I mean, I hate Canadians, but for other reasons. <laughs> I just hate Can no, no, but seriously, it's, it's not, it's, it's really not good. And I'm, I'm, I'm very, I'm very worried about the period that we're going through. And I'm, I'm, I'm very saddened by it. Please, if, if, if you follow me, and you care about the subject and you care, let's, let's assume for a second you care what I think. Please don't be so fucking lazy and self-indulgent to start stoning people. What was the point of the whole project, of the whole project of talking about narcissistic abuse of talking about psychopathic abuse, of talking about black sheeping people, of talking about scapegoating people, so that you can, or, or so that so that one, not you, but one, can then don the garments of the Spanish Inquisition and go and start fucking doing it to somebody else. Don't, please don't, please don't do that. Please don't join a fucking team and then go and attack another team. It's very, very disappointing for me it's very it's it's if you do that you, you're gonna hurt my feelings i don't like it and i would like it to stop it's uh it's i understand i understand how fun it is i understand the primal drive to create tribes and attack but it's not good enough it's not good enough Please don't do it. Don't, 
don't seek a team. Don't seek a team in a spirit of conflict. Don't seek an enemy in the spirit of sport. It's unacceptable. It's barbaric. It's psychopathic and it's narcissistic. So if you sit there and you say, all narcissists are shit and all victims are just the precious angels of the earth, that's not good. That's not good. The three human beings that I had these experiences with had very, very chaotic childhoods. The reason why they've adapted or maladapted into delusions of, uh, uh, of grandiosity and become persecutory and become unkind and become um, manipulative and psychopathic is because their minds were broken when they were children by horrendous pressures. I couldn't, I don't think I could recount what they experienced and managed to do the Q&A. It would be too much for me. Um, and this is why I don't coach people, you know, because in order to coach people, I don't have to go into people's childhoods and I can't, I can't deal with that. I can't, I can't cope with that. I'm not, I, I just, I'm not strong enough for it. I don't, I can't think about stuff like that. If you can, if you're of a mind to, if you can stretch yourself psychologically and, and mentally and philosophically, don't just bandy around the word empathy. It's, it's very popular to do that. You wanna be empathic, try to see things from the other person's point of view as though you were them and not just for a fucking second. Try to live in that person's shoes. They might not be you. There might be a different ethnicity, a different nationality, a different country, a different gender, whatever. But try. Don't just say you tried. Try. Put some heart into it. Put some fucking passion into it. Use your imagination. Go there. Think how they would think. Feel how they would feel. Their coordinates are not your coordinates. Okay, we know that. But try, try to feel some degree of empathy rather than just saying, well, they're shit, I'm good, the end. Try, and that doesn't mean you don't have boundaries. It doesn't mean you don't protect yourself. It doesn't mean you don't have standards, far from it. It means that you're not a brainwashed fucking zombie who's gonna fall, pro, uh, who's gonna fall prey to every type of propaganda that just happens to plop into your lap. These things, that we have inside of our skulls, we have to use them. We have to start using them. I will now do a Q&A. You can ask me questions. Please make them short and concise and legible and have them end in a question mark. That would be helpful. Ted is here to drink my milkshake. For that, you would need a straw. The breaches across the room. Richard, do you realize how much you help? Oh, that's very kind of you. Thank you. Um, I would like to.
Do they care about their children? Um, if you're talking about MPD, they don't care about anybody other than themselves in the way that you do. They're not capable of it. It's kind of a an ability that they don't have. No, is the answer. Not in the way that you do. What works for you to keep your prefrontal cortex strong? Um, reading. Thinking. Reading books I don't like in accordance with uh, the teachings of Dr. Paul Taylor. How do you get through the stalker phase of the X? Um, <clears throat> well, provided you're safe and it's not illegal, if it's a legal issue and you're unsafe, you have to go to the police. But if it's, if you're safe, um, one of the things I've found with, with therapy is it's really only me with me. It's just, it's just me. They're just my feelings. They're my thoughts. It's not that much about the other person. So even inside of the relationship, why couldn't I leave? Well, that wasn't anything. Nobody held a gun to my head. They were very manipulative, but it was my emotional flashbacks. It was my superego injunctions that kept me in it or kept me going back. So, you know, it's not really any of my bit. I have people now who are stalking me. I have people trying to crack into my Facebook account, into my Instagram, into my emails. Not every day, but every week. So I, I have, I have stalkers right now, but it's, it's not my. It's not. I can't. It's not really my pro My attitude to it is not really my problem. Thank you for sharing your story. Question mark. <laughs> Question, Richard, do you feel some compassion for your father uh, as a child? Yeah, of course, as a child. He had, uh, I was talking about my ex-girlfriend's childhood. Um, this was a, it was a horror show. Thank you for your honesty. Is it hard to be so brave? It's much harder to be cowardly, much harder, much more of a burden, much, much harder, much more tiring uh, for me. Thank you for your question. Is it always about reaction? Even strangers are the attraction. I don't know what that means, but it rhymes. Is it always about reaction? Even strangers are the attraction. It's like lyrics, it's bars. Richard, in therapy, are you learning to trust again? Uh, I, I have to be, I have to be honest um, here. I know that a lot of people struggle um, with trust issues. Uh, it's, it's not, it's not really a big issue for me. I struggle with my superego injunctions. It's not because it's not the case that I can say, oh, I really thought, you know, with objective analysis that this, put, like, I can tell if somebody's good or not. It's, that's not the problem for me. I know it, I know it is a problem for a lot of people. They, they don't know who to trust. I know who to trust. I know who I can't trust. I knew what types of people I was getting involved with. So it's a little bit more complicated than that. So, um, yeah, it's not a question of me going, oh, I can't be in a relationship again because I can't trust anybody. No, just get with the right kind of person and that, that's not an issue. How do you approach narcissistic people or navigate them? I use Pentax Silat. It's a Malaysian Indian, Asian, Ma Indonesian martial arts style. From the side, give them a give them a foot uppercut. 
um i i try not to like if i can see that somebody's highly narcissistic uh i would avoid it if i could um i can't think of a situation where i would need to approach a narcissistic person or navigate them um maybe appeal to their vanity and then don't challenge them if you were just if you were handling them we're back to spy games if they were a potential asset and they had to handle them use appeal to vanity do you vape nicotine yes oh please no graphic descriptions of violence i'm too sensitive darlings please no <laughs> daddy's daddy's very tired <laughs> i hate talking about my own experience it's 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 not good for me it's good for you though i guess after four years i'm doing escape i'm starting to hear things now uh from matrix program should i still consider therapy if i'm struggling yes definitely go to therapy how do you focus on work when going through, through so much pain? Oh, work is a wonderful way of avoiding pain. Yes. Bring out the old dissociation, ADHD, adrenophilia. It's a great way um, of, of dealing with, with, with pain. I'm, I'm not really dealing with that much pain, to be perfectly honest. This is a fairly peaceful time in my life. Are they voyeurs of life, says JP Gordon? That's a good question. The voyeurs of the movie of life that they are starring and directing in. Good question. Good answer. Liked it. Well done, JP Gordon. Well done, RV Granon. Good. <laughs> That's cheered me up. Freemasons, biggest lie, fake ball, earth. <laughs> fake ball, earth, biggest lie, biggest lie. How did you, how did you get out? Um, well, I just, well, I had the keys. <laughs> I just said to them, you see all your stuff you take that you go you leave the keys in the bowl by the door and then you go away <laughs> um no the getting out part was was dealing with was dealing with uh the superego injunctions was dealing with the inner voice that would be saying like you can't cope without them or worse they can't cope without you they'll die without you you have to go and save them so once I dealt with that, it was fairly straightforward. How do we show compassion for ourselves in an abusive relationship? How do you show compassion for yourself outside of an abusive relationship? Where, do, where does compassion for the self begin? Do you struggle to be compassionate for others? Others are just like you. So whatever standards you hold other people to, you hold yourself to. So if somebody else fell in love with a bad person would you say oh you fucking idiot what did you do that for you little piece of shit i hope not so don't do it to yourself if you would say to them hey you know you took the leap you had the courage to try and love somebody and to be vulnerable enough to love somebody which is a good thing they're just a very damaged person and they're not a good person to reciprocate your love and that's okay uh, if that's what you would say to somebody else then that's what you should say to yourself right miriam says thank you for being vulnerable like this for years especially as a child when i had no access to the internet i thought it only happened to me yeah i think a lot of people have that experience a lot of people do do you think two codependents can make it together? Codependents fuse and merge with each other. Um, they can, but they must go to therapy. 
not talk about go to therapy, but actually go to therapy and then do therapy. With all this knowledge, why is it so hard to close the door? Because knowledge isn't the difference that makes a difference. Not knowledge, but courage. Do narcissists employ passive aggressive techniques in communication online? Yes. Are there more women than male narcissists in your opinion? Uh, no, I don't, I don't think so. I think MPD is, you know, pan, pansexual, pan gender, pan nationality, pan ethnicity. I think it's been with us as long as we've been conscious. It's a part of the human condition. There's latent narcissism inside of everybody. It's the dividing line is not like between us and them. The dividing line runs down the human soul. Like it's, it's in all of us to do that. So no, I don't think it's more in women than in men. Um, being showed a twisted mind, should you always give them time? What is with these vague but poetic questions? <laughs> I like that it rhymes, but I, I can't answer that because I don't know what you mean. And it would be irresponsible. I watched The Menu yesterday. That's okay, because I like Ralph Fiennes. Um, it's similarly themed to The Triangle of Sadness. The Triangle of Sadness is probably a better film. Uh, the menu could have been something, but was a bit, I just, I didn't really know why we were doing what we were doing. And there's too many open loops by the end of the movie. Triangle of Sadness is disturbing, um, but but pretty profound. It was, a, it was a good movie. Not a feel good movie, but it makes you think. Civil War was pretty good. I liked it. A lot, of people, a lot of film critics that I like really didn't like Civil War. And I was like, no, I think it's good. I enjoyed the whole thing from beginning to end. It's like, well, they didn't pick a side. I was like, I think that's the point. I think the point is they weren't picking a side. How do you help someone for who you think is stuck in narcissistic relationship and doesn't want a therapy? I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I don't. I don't. I certainly don't do it professionally. And I don't do it with my friends. If they ask me for help, I will help them. But otherwise, I, I do nothing. Have you read about Richard Schwartz's model, internal family systems? And if so, do you see potential in it for healing? I've had IFS therapy. I thought it was very good. Very good. Very, very good. I highly recommend it. I highly recommend transactional analysis and IFS. Has your online work and presence benefited you on your personal journey healing? No, no. Um, I wish I hadn't done this now. Uh, and where do you see this going for you? Um, well, uh, probably towards some kind of a conclusion in the next 12 to 18 months. Um, But I want to make sure that I leave everything in good order um, and give people all the resources that they need uh, to crack on and, and to get on with things. So there's probably another book that needs to be written. There's another few courses I need to do. Uh, there's a direction change within the topic of narcissism that I have to go through, which would take at least six months. And then I think, I think that would be it for me. P.S. Thank you for all you've done. Thank you very much. Can you speak to playing Dom? Oh, God. Don't get me all hashtag triggered now. I'm feeling calm. Um, I could. I've done, I've done an hour. Do you mind if I don't? Can we do it another time? Can you just... The next time I do this, bring it up. Uh... I've spent years explaining, thinking he just didn't get it. No, he gets it just fine. I've sat with somebody, one of these three women, who has an objectively higher IQ than me, and I'm not stupid, 
who is better educated than I am and was a practicing scientist in the field for six years and drawn mind maps trying to explain why when she does X, it's considered rude. And it's got nothing to do with the fact that she's from a different culture or a different background, because I know it's fucking rude in that culture and background as well. I tried mind maps. I wrote essays. I tried, She knew perfectly well. And you know how I know? So all, all of my narcissistic abusive relationships, they played dumb. When we watch TV together and you watch movies and you watch series and you watch stories or you both read the same book not once did any of these women come to me and say i don't i don't understand why was david so angry in that scene when jessica banged his dad no they, they never asked me that they knew they knew perfectly well why david was angry when jessica banged his dad because they're not stupid this is just uh, one more level of game Having said I wouldn't talk about it, I believe I have. But we should perhaps talk about it more. Good question, I liked it. Um, stalking your channels is my favourite pastime, says Pickle. Wonderful. Uh, Plum Duff says, um, I discarded my female narcissist. Why is she stalking? Um, because you've inflicted a narcissistic injury and she probably wants to know why. How have psychedelics helped you in your journey? I'm not sure that they have. I'm not the one of these podcast bros who's like, yeah, man, take psychedelics. Um, and I don't extol the virtues of it. I did, I did acid first when I was 13 and I took another 10 trips up until the age of 18. I mean, really, it just made me obsessed with the idea that we're half alien, half human hybrids in some sort of a created world that if it's not a simulation, is some sort of an alien ant farm. And that surrealist artwork and some of our music and some of our architecture and many of our obsessions point to that that we're some sort of project in forcing evolution. What else does it get me obsessed with? It got me obsessed with the nature of God, reality, and time as a fluid substance. Got me obsessed with language. I think everybody who takes psychedelics starts having a good old think about language. Um, but in terms of healing, I don't know, man. Didn't do much for me. And then when I hear the podcast bros and their friends talk about how it helped them to heal and it did this and it did that. I just sit there and I'm like, did you, did, did you, did you try therapy? Did, did you go to a therapist and tell him or her the truth and just try therapy? Did you read books? Like definitely read books, definitely write, have some creative endeavor something there should be some form of creative expression somewhere in your life and seek to expand your mind seek to think more clearly and more deeply psychedelic just means expanding of the mind i mean i don't know i was listening to some hideous descriptions of bad trips on mushrooms today which people say you can't have a bad trip on um i'm not saying there's no place for psychedelics and I don't, I can't calibrate how much psychedelics helped me or didn't help me because I already took them. I can't, I don't know how I would think if I didn't take them. It definitely made me less racist. It definitely, it definitely made me more open to other cultures. Um, because, um, <laughs> It's not that I was particularly racist as a kid, but um, I didn't, <laughs> I didn't think that people from other ethnicities and other places who were humans saw the world 
the way I did and had the same primal responses that I did until I took psychedelics. And then some kind of peeling back of the layers of the ego, like you're male, you're from the northwest of England, you're born in 1978 and that dissolves. It's like you really like martial arts, you think Bruce Lee is really cool, you love Quentin Tarantino and that melts away. And the next thing melts away and the next thing melts away and the next thing melts away and the next thing melts away. And then the thing that knows levels of melting away melts away and you end up with just this huge eye of Horus that just sees and all it does and all it can do is observe. It just observes. And you're like, oh, so past all the bullshit, if I was Nigerian or Okinawan or Uruguayan or whatever, and we got past all the bullshit, that's where it's at, is this just the observing force. So, <clears throat> yeah. Richard, are you ever gonna move to, going to move to the United States? When the military coup happens, if they can theatrically make it look like they're forcing me into power. And I'm like, guys, no, really? Okay, then yes, but otherwise, no, 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 I don't think so. Um, I'm very, very connected to Europe. I feel very good about Europe. I love Europe. I love, I, I like America. I like uh, the natural beauty that's there, but I, I don't feel compelled to, I mean, it's hard to live there. Do you know how effing hard it is for me to even extend my visa there? It's really hard. It's really, really tough. Um, so no, I don't feel any particular drive to live there. Though I do like, I think about the place a lot. I just read another Cormac McCarthy book last night. I read Out of Dark. And I'm like, why am I obsessed with this Cormac McCarthyan view of this horrible, primitive, you know, pre-civilized or semi-civilized version of America? I just find it fascinating. If you're American, you should read Cormac McCarthy. Richard, would you like to come over to Romania in the future? I will. I'm due to. I have friends there. So definitely I will come to Romania again. I like Romania very much. I feel very comfortable there. Um, do you think relationships are basically family constellation therapy? Uh, no. Everybody sees an avatar of somebody they are not. Possibly. Uh, fight between reality and imagination. Interesting. I think that um, family constellations will give you a good perspective on your relationships, for sure. Hey, Richard, been listening to you for almost 10 years. Uh, I've improved a lot, but I'm still unsuccessful in maintaining healthy relationships. Any advice? Um, nothing I can tell you here is going to help you. Nothing. Nothing I can say inside of like 30 to 60 seconds is going to help you. Um, you really should go to therapy. You should speak to a therapist and get some help with that. And they will tell you why it is that you say you want to do a thing and you have the capacity to do the thing, and yet you do it not. That needs a, a long-term dialogue that's probably gonna take a few months. Do you feel you don't deserve it? Is he psychic? Portugal's on the cards for you at one point. Maybe Portugal would be a nicer experience. I really like Spain, but they're just making it difficult for me to move here. But yeah, Portugal's a possibility. Bruce Wayne is here. Richard, your knowledge and full understanding of MPD truly helped me streamline my understanding of it. I'm about to be 40. So shortly, happy birthday to you, Bruce Wayne. What makes a worse narcissist? Childhood pedestalization or trauma? They need both. Well, pedestalization is trauma. Spoiling a child is instrumentalizing and objectifying a child which ultimately still does damage in much the same way that trauma would. So two poles are required in my view. They're, they're, they have to be split between two poles um, that are
uh, that you can't um, God damn it. Come on, brain. So in the Hegelian dialectics, you have thesis, antithesis, and then you have synthesis. What is the verb by which you make a thesis and an antithesis a synthesis? Whatever that verb is, someone will tell me. Hypothesis, no. I'll come. It'll come as soon as I click end and finish this. How much longer will it take? I don't know. Every day I awaken to another day in this morbid, vile, Yaldabaoth inspired pre Gnostic simulation, asking myself the same question. How much longer will it take? I've been trying for years, but the latest narcissist has me determined to leave forever and have a great life. Lilith, do not fall for such things. When you take two things that oppose each other and you bring them together and cause them to compromise and to unify, what's the verb that allows you to do that? Thank you for your vulnerability. If I hadn't lived this twice, one grandiose, one dark triad, a dark triad, dark triad. Uh, it would sound fantastical. Your experience is so real, it's chilling. Thank you, I'm glad it resonated. Why doesn't going not, no contact not work? When we say that something works or doesn't work, that implies there is an objective we have to define what the objective is first before we can know whether something is working or not. My neighbor in the flat above plays bass 24 seven through speakers in every room. Neighbor is narcissistic. I feel like I'm being made to feel I'm the mad person. Where's the flat earth gone? It was because I left it and he left. <laughs> I want more flat earth ranting. Okay, I'll do one more question and then I'll, and then I'll, I'll end. You've made a big difference. Thank you, Veronica. Talking is good, but everything is solved by walking. You sound like Nietzsche. Talking and walking, that'll be my new therapy. Be like, you. I'll talk to you. I'm not giving you therapy, but you can come on a walk with me. Uh, David Flick says, thank you for your fortress tutorials. The hand mnemonics and therapy helped me get out of a very difficult relationship. Thank you, Dave. Glad it helped. For people who want to benefit from that, go to YouTube, Fortress Mental Health Protection. There's a whole free course there just for you if you're looking to overcome CPTSD. Individuate? No. Osmosis? No, but I like these efforts. Um, the dork triad. <laughs> hey man, you're on the dork triad. A reconcile, it's closer. Reconcile, amalgamate. I think reconcile is the closest to it. I just thought there was another verb. Reconcile, amalgamate. Reconcile is probably the closest. Thank you. Still something there. Individuate. Okay. So, um, integrate. It is. It is an integration, but it's, it's probably the reconciling of differences. Um, ah, Natalie Harstock. Do you think evolution favors narcissistic behaviors? Why can I not? Why am I out of control? Primal Way is here saying, when will someone have the balls to point out that most women are the narcissist terrorizing society? Primal Way with a cartoon picture of himself with big biceps. I wish you would have the balls to tell the truth, man, like I do, because I'm primal. And I drink whey. 
I'm on my primal way to being an alpha male. I'm 25. I live in my mom's basement. She washes my socks. By the summertime, I'll have abs. Yeah, man. How many ebooks did you read on being an alpha male? <laughs> How much of that primal way you been drinking, boy? <laughs> Do not mock me. I am primal. And I drink way, I am primal way. You can tell from my cartoon biceps, boy. I'm an alpha male. Women wish you would have the balls. <laughs> I wish you, I wish you would have the goddamn balls to just say the women are the narcissist, man, like I do. I'm hanging my balls real low right now, and I'm going to tell you with my cartoon biceps. I've been drinking Andrew Tate's way straight from his primal. <laughs> oh. oh, yeah. Oh, you're, you're definitely under 30. Oh, God. You definitely ain't traveled outside your country. You definitely haven't done a proper job. Proper back-breaking job for a couple of years, boy. Something that just breaks your soul. Too much time online, sir. Too much time online. Keep drinking that primal way with your cartoon biceps. Primal way. Good American accent. Yeah. I'm a real American. Most of the grannons in the world are in America. Grannon is... Um, is from um, uh, the West Coast, uh, sort of Galway side, and a lot of Irish left uh, when the British starved them and went to America. And so you have Grannons and you have Gannons. It's the same family. You have Gannon Cannons all over America and they drink their prime away. Because they're real Americans and they got the balls to say it how it is. Why wouldn't you have the God? <laughs> I actually quite enjoy that. I used to set up a YouTube channel that just mocks alpha male training. And I bet you if I spoke like that, nobody would realize I was taking the piss. Hello, welcome, ladies and gents. My channel, Primal Way. I'm going to teach you how to be a real man. Like me. First thing is, you got to drink your primal way. Guzzle it down. <laughs> primal way. Props for primal way for sticking around for the roasting. Damn right. America. <laughs> I roasted him for five minutes and he stayed in the ring. So you got to respect that. Good for you, sir. Good for you. Uh, I just, I just, I needed this and it's helped me a lot. Okay, so um, we call this being punch drunk, being silly in the best. <laughs> That's, oh no, just, just, you've got it. <laughs> That's right. I've, I've literally heard this. I've literally heard this as a whole philosophy. Real men love men yeah well the the original branding was spartan life coach which i called it that for reasons i've given in other interviews it was supposed to appeal to like because when i was teaching the self-defense stuff the combative stuff the psychology it attracted a lot of like uh, uh veterans and and serving military and law enforcement security guys and they kind of were on the edges of therapy but they were too manly to go to a therapist and they would even say to me i had special forces guys who were going not very well with PTSD. And I would say, go to a therapist. I'm not seeing a fucking shrink. Fuck that. Fucking weirdos. No, I'll talk to you. And I'm like, you can't talk to me. I'm not qualified. And my life is a mess. Nah, but you're one of the lads. It'll be all right. I'm like, you can't, can't ask me to lead you anywhere. So I called it Spartan Life Coach because the 300 was popular. And I read um, Pillars of Fire or Gates of Fire by... by um, Stephen Pressman, which is a which is a good fun 
book. It's fictional. It's not a good place to learn the history, but it's a good book. It's uh, Stephen Pressfield. Stephen Pressfield. That is a good, fun book, and you can get through it in about three days. I highly recommend it. It's an action book. It's great. Um, so, but I didn't really know that much about Spartan culture. And then I learned about all the stuff with the kids and the enforced stuff with the boys and then the women having to dress up like boys because the men had spent so much time in sexual contact with other men that they couldn't deal with women. The women had to wear like a men's night clothing and get their hair cut. And then the slavery and the stuff and the things. And I was like, ah, I think I should change the concept. I think I should just start calling it richardgranon.com. All right, I am done. So I hope that that was useful. And if it wasn't, forgive me with all the empathy and compassion you can muster. Um, I meant what I said. These are difficult times. Don't fall prey to the terrible, terrible darkness that lurks at the edges. Hold to the light, as Cormac McCarthy advised us. May he rest in peace. No matter how dark it gets, hold to the light. Ladies and gents, thank you very much for your time and for your attention. And I surely look forward to speaking to you all again very soon. Keep it primal. Hooah!